For more than three decades, David Zayas has created indelible characters on stage, on film, and on TV. He is best known to television audiences for his role as Angel Batista on the Showtime Golden Globe-nominated psychological drama Dexter. A former New York City police officer, David began his acting career with Labyrinth Theatre Company in 1992. He has starred in more than 30 theater productions, most with Labyrinth, Jesus Hop the A-Train, In Arabia We'd All Be Kings, Our Lady of 121st Street, and made his Broadway debut in Nilo Cruz's Pulitzer Prize-winning Anna in the Tropics. Last fall, David returned to Broadway to star as Eddie in Manhattan Theater Club's Broadway debut of Martina Mayock's Pulitzer Prize-winning play, Cost of Living. David has been nominated for a Drama League Distinguished Performance Award, an Outer Critics Circle Award for Outstanding Featured Performer in a Play, and a Tony Award for Best Feature Actor in a Play for his role as Eddie. Cost of Living is also nominated for Best Play, Best Director, and Best Featured Actress in a Play for Katie Sullivan and Kara Young. Welcome to this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang. I'm your host, Leah Chang. Today I'm sitting down with David Sayas at the West Bank Cafe, and we're here to talk about Tony Awards season, and congratulations Thank on your you. Tony nomination for Thank Cost of Living. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so excited, and I'm very thankful. Now, where were you when you first found out that you were nominated? I was in Wyoming. Uh, I was there with my son, and we were having uh, talks with uh, drama students in the University of Wyoming and in uh, different other community colleges for acting. And uh, it was my son's birthday on the 2nd of May, and we were celebrating his birthday. And when we woke up that morning, I found out that I was nominated for a Tony Award. Uh, it was a good day. Martina wrote a play that it's, it would be almost, I mean, it's just a brilliantly constructed play. And it's, uh, it's so, has so many feelings. It's so, it, it's, it was an opportunity for me as an actor to uh, go places that I haven't gone before, you know, emotionally. Um, it gave me that opportunity to do that. And it was really hard, um, but um, that, that's the, that was the perfect role to, to just open up, you know, and, and uh, deal with loss, deal with love, deal with uh, uh, just passionate people that you don't, the characters you don't normally see on the Broadway stage, you know, and uh, my mother had passed away last April, so that was kind of fresh in my mind, so the whole idea about uh, loss and about grief um, was easily um, accessible to me. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. And plus everybody, you know, it's, it's one thing when you're working on a play and the writer, the director, all the, the other cast members, everybody, it's, they're all 110% invested in excellence. Um, it's, it's, it's really a wonderful, wonderful place to be at and to work. Now who is Eddie in Cost of Living? Eddie is a Puerto Rican truck driver from Jersey who has uh, uh, recently uh, lost his wife or his ex-wife of many years and uh, he talks about it in the first, uh, the first few minutes of the play. And then it goes back in time to show the relationship between him and his ex-wife who recently got in a car accident. Um, and uh, became a paraplegic and lost her legs in, in the character, Annie. And um, he comes back for whatever reason, whether it's guilt, whether it's sense of duty, whether it's just a, 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 an opportunity for redemption uh, to try and caretake for his ex-wife. And a lot, of, a lot of clash happens in between there. And then, in correspondence is another scene, another scene where there's a young man 
a graduate student um, who has uh, cerebral palsy and he hires a young woman to caretake for him. And so there's two stories where at the end they, you know, somehow intertwine and tells this beautiful story of... And what spoke to you about Eddie? Uh, the opportunity for... The opportunity for redemption and the opportunity to fix certain things that you kind of ruined mm. in your life. It's always attractive to me because I've always, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've, you know, and, but if I ever had an opportunity to kind of make up to me, mm -hmm. and Eddie has an opportunity to at least try to help the person that he loved even though the marriage didn't work out. So what do you want to do for your birthday? The weather's supposed to be nice next month. It'll be November in New Jersey. <laughs> and you can't tell weather that far in advance. We can plan on it being nice, and if it's not, then we'll roll with it. We? What would you want to do? You won't be here. Why not? You got your drive. What if I took off? And what if you paid your bills? Don't take off work. Listen, woman. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Don't promise me things, Eddie. What would you want to do? <laughs> you wouldn't like it. It's not about me. Maine. I want to go to Maine for my birthday. It's cold up there, See? right? And it rains a lot. It's all like fancy boats and shit. You're lobsters. thinking of Seattle. Well, they got fancy boats there too, right? Maybe. Never been. That's why I want to go. Okay. Yeah. But Maine, that's like Canada. <laughs> Why you want to go to Maine? I saw this picture once on Janie's desk, some trip she took with the kids after the divorce to Maine. A the photo? You want to go to Canada because of a, shit, I'll show you some photos of PR. You'll change your mind about fucking Canada. <laughs> the frame was made out of wood, but like real wood? It was just four little twigs tied together, but somehow it looked nicer than if someone tried to turn it into wood. And Janie's got a hat on because it's so sunny in Maine. So you can't see her eyes, but you can see her mouth, which looked good. Her in a field, and she's holding a stick like a cane. It's just her by herself, and she's fine. And there's a lot of green. Is that, is that where you were going that night? It's what they told me later when the ambulance found me, they said that's what I said. I wasn't, but, but maybe I would have if I kept driving. Working with uh, Katie was uh, a great experience for me. Because um, ultimately, she's, she's just a great actor, you know. And uh, the fact that, you know, she has a disability. Uh, no, I, I had to catch up with her. You know, she, she, was, she was on it. She was there 100% every single time and uh, really impressive to me. And, and I loved working with her and it was, uh, it was a lot of trust there. Yeah. Well, you both are nominated for Tony's. Yes. Um, but you also both were nominated for Drama League Award, uh, Distinguished Performance Awards. And at the luncheon, she referenced you. My face is covered in bubbles like Santa Claus gone wrong. <laughs> and before I could panic, because I can't move, um, he was like a goddamn ninja. And he was like, Phew! like, took the bubbles all the way off of my face. So if you indulge me, please. Would you raise your glass to David Zayas for not only figuratively saving my life eight shows a week, but literally saving my face. David Zayas, I love you. Thank you. All really special, but my favorite would be um, the best one, I feel. The, uh, the one that I got the opportunity to really sink my teeth in would be Dexter, uh, Angel Batista and Dexter, which, you know, 
I started reading him when I got the part and I read the book, uh, Darkly Dreaming Dexter, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read my character, and then the, to see that transfer to the, you know, the script and and doing it, it was so many opportunities for me to explore different aspects of uh, this human being. Because how many seasons did you work on Dexter? Eight, and then I was in a couple episodes from the last one, the New Blood, that came out. I've always wanted really to be an actor. So ever since I saw. Raul Julia in Three Penny Opera when I was like 13, 14 years old. You know, my father worked for the city, he was a sanitation, for the city, for the Department of Sanitation. Um, and uh, my grandfather worked for the city, my uncle worked in Con Edison. Uh, so uh, my upbringing was hardworking, blue collar men. And did you think that that would have been your path before I thought, you thought? I thought that was the you know, that was that the, was only. Well, it was the path that I recognized, and it was the path that I observed, and it was. Um, so that's what it, I was thinking about. So when I when I was young and I wanted to be an actor, I kind of just shifted it in the back because I really didn't get support from my family to do this. It wasn't until I was like in the already a, a police officer um, so at this how old were you when you became a police officer I was 22 I was 22 and I about when I was 29 is when I decided hey, I'm gonna try this after after seeing a performance of a few good men on Broadway I was like I don't know I don't know in what capacity but I want to be involved in something that's going to make people feel the way I feel right now watching mm. this. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a spark where when I got out of the theater, I think I ran four blocks just for no reason at all. I just had to like let out that energy. And then the next day I started taking acting classes. You can just, you know, go with the flow and, or you can knock these doors down and kind of just intrude in what everybody thinks they want to watch or they want to see. I think that you have to kind of explode into the scene and say this is a story about a Puerto Rican family, a Cuban family, an Asian American family. This is the story and you're gonna wanna hear, you're gonna wanna know this story. I, I never felt that I was, I, I was disadvantaged. Now granted, I'm Puerto Rican, but I'm, I'm very white. Right. So um, I didn't have that yeah. issue that maybe African Americans had or Afro Latinos have, you know. Um, but I still never felt like I don't belong in the party. I do. The, um, Ernie Martin, who was my first acting teacher, who would not let me quit when I was like, this is too hard, this is really hard, I'm, you know, I'm gonna go and try and make detective in the police department, I don't know if I, but he wouldn't let me quit, he goes, this is what you're meant to do, this is what, just keep keep doing it. So he's the first one. Um, and then, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who uh, was also a friend of mine, and he also directed me in five of the most influential plays that helped me as an actor and watching him and his work ethic and and watching how he committed to everything really taught me how to how to work in the theater you know i was like he never told you to do anything he wasn't really in fact there were some things he did that i don't know if i could do i was like okay wow this guy's amazing and he was just an amazing artist and, and just an amazing guy. Everything had to do with the work. Um, so he's one, and another one is uh, Tom Fontana. Tom Fontana gave me my first, uh, he's a producer, writer, did Homicide, Life in the Street, St. Elsewhere, um, Oz. And he gave me my first opportunity on television to be on the show called The Beat. Um, and he took a shot at me. I was, you know, with really, I was just so lucky to get that opportunity. 
and there I went to talk. I did Oz that he wrote. So he's he's one also that I admire. Then I have to go back and, and see and just my father and how hard he worked and how um, with like no education he had to quit school when he was young to take care of his mom. And he worked he was in the sanitation, we were the sanitation man, he also had two other jobs. So just watching him work so hard to because I had a really good upbringing. I, I didn't I can't say I come from a broken family or I come from an abusive family. My family was loving. Yes, we had our issues, but every family we're has their issues. We're all dysfunctional. But ultimately, my view on life uh, was it, it, with the lens of watching my parents mm. and watching his uh, his just ability to take care of his family. And my mother, who uh, I recently lost the, the year before we started the play. Um, from her, I got how to be kind and how to be giving to people because that's what she was. She was kind, she was giving, you know, and, and it, it, it was just, how can I help my family? How can I help my friends? And that's, I, I got that from her and so I admire her very much. So unfortunately, neither one of them are here uh, anymore, but that They're stays. angels on yeah, your that shoulder stays, and, exactly. and, and are guarding you from above. Yeah. And they got to see some of my uh, some of, some of my success. They were able to experience that with me. Um, so yeah. Death in the Maiden was on Broadway, and it's uh, a story about. A, it takes place in. Uh, in the, every, every character is Latino. They're, they're from uh, Chile or from South America. And it was uh, it was Richard Dreyfuss, Gene Hackman, and Glenn Close. And so, I, I, somebody asked in the New York Times. Who um, among them were Latino? <laughs> right. <laughs> Though they were all brilliant, and I think Mike Nichols directed that uh, play also. But the, one of the producers of them say, well, you know, there are no Latino actors out there. That, oh. That's, you know. Oh, so the producers said there are no Latino actors. That's right. why we didn't cast Latino actors, even <laughs> though this is a Latino story. Yes, yes. And so... Uh, these guys, uh, John Ortiz and David Devlinger, Gary Perez, uh, they heard, they read this, and they're like, "Let's create, let's create a, la a, a, a Latin theater." So it's called the Lab, Latinos Actors Base. And right away, we realized, well, you know, we 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 want to open it up and include a, a, a multi-ethnic vision of how New York really is right you know so we opened it up the name got changed to Labyrinth Theatre Company and we uh, went uh, well the powers to be the Devlinger Ortiz and, and Gary Perez went mm -hmm. to um, Max Farrar and Intel because they had just done a play there mm -hmm. in Intel and they're saying we're forming a company and uh, Max Farrar was very generous in saying Use that my space in 53rd Street. Nothing. We're not. Nobody's doing anything there. So we all, when we formed the company, we all went in there. We cleaned everything out, and we've had a space to to work with. Every Wednesday night, we would just get together and just play and bond and learn from each other. And and what an amazing sense of community. Yes, it was. It was amazing. It was also my interest. Like, I, I had just started acting school. I didn't have any experience. I didn't have, I, uh, you know, my first play was with Labyrinth. Um, Stephen didn't write that play. Stephen came in as an actor. Uh, you know, we all wrote a scene. Most of them were really bad. But Stephen, I said, this is really good. And he's, so, he's so gifted. Yeah. He has such an um, ear for language. Yes, he does. And yes. dialogue. Yeah. So he, they asked him, you know, would you be willing to write a play for us, you know, for Labyrinth? He goes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an actor, I'm not really, 
but he wasn't quite ready to give it up. But he did. He wrote this one act uh, that he asked me and this other really good actor, uh, David Ansuelo, mm -hmm. a member of our company, mm -hmm. to be in. It's called Francisco and Benny. All Stephen Ali Girgis plays, you know, he's the director by Philip that we had the most uh, success and, and, and longevity mm -hmm. with, like, in Arabia we'd all be kings, uh, Jesus hopped the A-train, which to me, in my opinion, is, is uh, Stephen's uh, best work. Mm. Um, and then Our Lady of 121st Street, which ran for like six months at the uh, Union Square Theater, which I don't believe is no longer there. I don't think um, and uh, and then you know it was those those three plays. We got to go to London with Jesus Out the A Train. We got to go to Edinburgh, the Fringe Festival, um, and it was well received. And and we kind of you know helped put Labyrinth on the map. You um, can actually. And that was we, a motherfucker is... with the hat. <laughs> um, and I remember going to see uh, Bobby Cannavale, and it was Chris Rock was in it. Yul Vasquez, and uh, it was it was a really uh, was an amazing play, you know. And it was, uh, I think, another one that got into Broadway. I think that was his first Broadway mm -hmm. experience. Um, but yeah, and so it's like I've, I've been lucky that I've been uh, able to um, do shows by these ama uh, amazing writers, and playwrights, you know, Stephen Adigirgis, Nilo Cruz. Martina Mayoke, you know. So what was, what was it like, what's the difference between the first time you were on Broadway to now? Um, or was I, there? I, would, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you're, you're doing it, the work, they so were maybe both, it's not. Yeah, they were, I mean, it was, it was, they were both amazing plays. I think that my role in Cost of Living um, gave me more of an opportunity to really stretch out and, and show you know, how I can go to places where I didn't go in, in other right. That you actually have paved the way yourself for many other artists. You know, I, I hope so. It, it, it's always... Um, one day I'm on the train, on the subway. This was, I think, about two, three years back. I was going downtown, I said, I'm gonna jump on the subway. I jumped on the subway, and on uh, 66th Street stop of the one train, these, uh, all these, these kids came in, these young, young adults came. And they obviously came from high school performing arts. Mm. They finished school, they got on the train. Mm -hmm. And a group of them sit, and I guess, and, and they're all reading <laughs> <laughs> Jesus out <laughs> here. And you're in the, and I'm in the, you're in the yeah, cast I'm, list, I'm, right? I'm watching them, and, uh, and I see all of them. They all have the book. They must be doing it in class. Yeah. Which I, I'm surprised that she's out the air train. going to be in her high school. <laughs> but it was. And, uh, you know, it was... Uh, and I, I didn't say anything, but I watched them, and they were talking about how exciting the play was. Mm. They were like, did you read this part? And they were talking to each other. And I, I thought about it, and then they, they mentioned the character that I played, Valdez. And they had such an intellectual take on that character, because that's a brutal character. Right. He's a, you know, um, and I'm just listening. It's a nihilistic yeah, I'm, character. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm listening to it, and I just, it, I'm like, wow, okay. Um, and they were talking about the names of the character, of the actors. They knew this actor. Wow. They knew. At least they had a really good teacher too. Yeah, they had a really. They must have had a really good teacher. It's a good, great school. My niece graduated from uh, LaGuardia, and I realized, you know, they're studying parts that Stephen would like write and and say, read this, and you know, scene by scene by scene, doing that play. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh yeah, we, we've actually created a path for some of these, some of these young people to like, you know, explore this work and that, get to be. And get to yeah, exactly. And it's, so it's yeah, it's it's never thought about it, but yeah, you do you know uh, set a a, a a path for you know other like 
like me and watching Raul Julia when I was 14 doing Three Penny Opera, recognizing his accent. It was like my family, how they speak. And it kind of set a bulb that, oh, yes, we can, we can do this. We can do, we can do Shakespeare. We can yes. do, and we don't need to change, uh, you know, uh, the way we are. We don't need to like be someone else other than who we are and play these roles. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if, if I've changed one young person's uh, life and how they approach what they want to do, then that's, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. So one of the other really exciting things about this Broadway season was the fact that not only were you in cost of living, but a number of other labyrinth company members were in the Broadway production of Steve Adley Gerges's Between Riverside and Crazy. Yes. Not the least of which is your wife, Liza Colon. Yes. 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 It's, it's, um, it's, it was amazing. What, I mean, a, what, what a, what a, what a season to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and not only, not only Liza, who, who's so wonderful in the play, but I you love know, Stephen this, can, this, this canavan has been in all his, all of Stephen's plays also. Yes. I've done, the, in fact, the most plays I've ever done has been with this canavan. Oh. Um, so many plays that I've, uh, she's a wonderful, uh, uh, just a wonderful actor who just needs to get more recognition mm -hmm. because she's just got so much to offer. She's just uh, a, a beautiful performer. Um, and Stephen McKinley Henderson, who is, we call him the master. Because Cause he got, is. If you got anything asked to ask, Stephen McKinley Henderson will give you the tactful, just answer the truth in a very tactful way. He he reminds me a lot of uh, Andre the Shields mm. and how they how they communicate with others, particularly younger people. You know, um, he's just very inspiring. Um, and then you have uh, Liza who was in it, and then there's so many. And then Stephen Ali Gig is having a, his second play on Broadway also and, and uh, Long Overdue. Long overdue, yeah. You know, so and hopefully there'll be uh, a few more coming up. You know. From both him and Martina, you know, she's right. got a, an amazing future. She's so talented and she just knows how to tell a story. David Zayas, Cost of Living. Hello? Okay. Uh, guess being an ass is really interesting. When I first met Audra in London many, many years ago, it was a beautiful experience. Thank you. Um, I want to just say I used to usher here when it was a movie theater in the 70s. I just dated myself, didn't I? Yeah. Um, very wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. My beautiful cost of living uh, the cast, Joe Bonney, Martina Mayoc, who wrote it. I love you, Katie. You saved my life every night going on there. Um, and wonderful cast. Thank you so much, Drama League, particularly E.B. Thank you, our uh, directing fellowship. You, were, you meant so much to our production, and I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be in a room with like amazing artists. You're all beautiful and you're all sexy. It's amazing. Um, thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, David.